Hi, everybody. I am your next panel. Me. Yeah, this is my panel solo all by myself. Um, and I have a slideshow, but I'm going to just completely go off uh, script and not use my slideshow uh, and just go right into the presentation. Uh, I'll give a quick caveat that uh, I'm a, an employee of ReSound Music Licensing. I'm going to talk in this panel about um, SoCan, Sound Exchange, Connect, uh, MROC, ActorX, Artisti, SoProc, all kinds of organizations that I don't have any type of binding authority authority to whatsoever. I can speak to ReSound Music Licensing, uh, and I'm knowledgeable with those other organizations, but I'm not, uh, please don't just take my word uh, and, and say that you know they have to do something because I said so. I, I am knowledgeable about those organizations, but uh, I can only really speak to, to ReSound Music Licensing. Um, so my name is Phil Laffin. I've been working in uh, music rights for 10 years. Uh, I'm originally from Newfoundland. I moved to Ontario about 15 years ago. Uh, I started working at the CMRRA, which handles mechanical royalties. Um, after three years at CMRRA, I moved to ReSound Music Licensing. Uh, currently, I'm senior representative at ReSound. Um, and just out of curiosity, how many people are aware of ReSound and what we do? The person that I spoke to on the way here about us? No. <laughs> um, so that's kind of a little bit of a jarring statistic that the majority of the people in this room don't know um, who ReSound are uh, because we pay you money and you should be aware of that. Um, we are, yeah, I'll ask another question. How many people here are aware of who SoCan are? Pretty much everybody, I'm assuming. So, so can pay songwriters and composers music royalties. Um, if you are a musician, a performer, or you um, own your master rights for your recordings, then you get paid by ReSound. Uh, we collect licenses, sorry, rather, we collect royalties from businesses, organizations in Canada that play recorded music. Um, and we distribute royalties to what we refer to as performers and makers. So that's your singers, your drummers, your bass players, saxophone players, as well as the people who own the master rights to the sound recording itself. Um, in Canada, the landscape for music royalties is diverse. It is a um, very complicated landscape, and so it can be very confusing to know where your royalties are coming from and to ensure that you are getting compensated for uh, your music being played. So if you are a songwriter and a composer, you will get royalties from SoCan, but if you're also performing on that sound recording, you are also eligible to collect royalties from other organizations. Um, I will give a brief history of our organization, ReSound, uh, and talk about music royalties in general, and then I'll just open it up wide open for questions because that will, I think, get past a lot of the, um, there's a lot of just like jargon about tariffs and royalties and everything and how that works. Um, ReSound has been around since 1997. Prior to 1997 in Canada, performers and makers were not able to collect royalties for their sound recordings. In 1997, a group of five performance rights organizations lobbied the Copyright Board for changes in legislation to get us more in line with the international community in terms of royalties, and the Neighboring Rights Collective of Canada was born. So our member organizations, MROC, ActorRax, Artisti, SoProc, and Connect, they all lobbied the Copyright Board for changes to the Act to recognize the contributions of performers on sound recordings. Uh, as well as the people who finance the making of those sound recordings to be able to get compensated when that recording is publicly performed either in a bar, dance club, gym, at a Calgary Flames game, wherever. Um, so 1997, we were the Neighboring Rights Collective of Canada. We had one tariff with the Copyright Board. A tariff is essentially how we are able to um, get businesses to pay for the use of music. We have a, a team of lawyers um, that go to the Copyright Board. They go to um, 
you know, lots of meetings with industry associations, and they will lobby for changes to the Copyright Act that affect as a tariff. Um, we started with one tariff for radio broadcast, which is still one of our biggest and best in terms of revenue generation for performers. Um, but since 1997, now we have upwards of 18 tariffs for the, the use of sound recordings in businesses. To give you an idea of how that works, once we go to the copyright board and we lobby them, we'll negotiate with industry associations so that we can come to a fair, um, a fair agreement as to what the, the compensation for the use of music should be for specific instances. Um, then that tariff will get certified and we will start contacting businesses to let them know of what we say is their statutory obligation to pay for the use of music in their business. Um, we, more often than not, we won't go to the copyright board and fight with the industry association. We'll go to the copyright board with a market rate agreement. So for instance, one example in Canada is um, with Good Life Fitness, they use music in their classes that they provide and they have background music in their gym. We look at the specific usages of music that they have. We went to Good Life before going to the copyright board and said, there is absolutely a statutory obligation for you guys to pay for the use of that music. Let's come to an agreement on what that should look like. They actually did their own research. We did our research and we came together on what we found is a fair market rate agreement for the use of music by that business. We then together go to the copyright board, which simplifies things infinitely, and we present that market agreement to the copyright board and say, look, we've come to terms on what this should look like. We would like you to certify this as a tariff. The copyright board then certifies that tariff, and we can now apply that to other gyms, Planet Fitness, CrossFit gyms, um, and use that tariff to collect. We, there is a, there's a period for which that tariff is certified and we have to go back to the copyright board and recertify every roughly five years because of inflation, market rate changes to the usage of music, changes to the technology. Um, but essentially that's how it works. So we'll go to the copyright board with, hope, usually with a uh, partnership from an industry association, usually the largest, get something certified uh, and then apply that elsewhere. So we did a, a very similar thing with uh, sports franchises in Canada. Um, same thing, recognizing their use of music, go to them, negotiate a fair agreement, then take that to the copyright board, and then we can apply that to all of the other sports leagues in Canada. Um, once those tariffs are certified, my job, uh, my day-to-day -day job, this is a better part of my job, my day-to-day -day job is to call up businesses that aren't aware that they're supposed to be paying for the use of music and educate them let them know that they have to pay, and um, usually there's a, there's a bit of a, a negotiation and settlement of past terms. When the copyright board certifies a tariff, they don't say, okay, going forward, you have to pay this, uh, because it takes years sometimes before the copyright board actually will, will certify it. So generally speaking, if a tariff is certified in 2018, they'll say, okay, this is for the years of 2015 to 2020. Um, so we have to go back and collect for those three years will negotiate with businesses to let them know, you know, you have to pay back this far. We collect that and then um, we distribute those royalties to, performance, uh, to performers and to makers. With ReSound, every royalty dollar is split 50-50. 50 cents of every dollar goes towards paying the performers on the tracks and 50 cents on the dollar goes to it towards paying the, the makers, the, the labels, or in the case of independent artists who own their own master recordings. To the, directly to those, um, the owners of the masters. Um, so that is, that's one royalty. This is, all of this falls under what are called neighboring rights. Um, they're called neighboring rights because in 1997 when it got certified by the copyright board, it was neighboring legislation to the existing copyright legislation. So the existing copyright legislation was there for, you know, publishing rights, so can um, mechanical royalties, those existed prior to 1997. They added this whole new section to the Copyright Act that neighbored the existing legislation. That got called neighboring rights. Um, so my day-to-day -day job is to call up businesses after a tariff has been certified or after we've gotten an agreement in place and to let them know of their obligation to pay, to educate them on why they should pay, and also not just 
not just from a confrontational standpoint to say, look, you owe us money and you have to pay us, but to also educate them on the benefits of using music in their business. So there's research showing that um, shoppers can be influenced to linger, you know, five minutes longer in a business that's playing background music. Um, if you, this, and it's a really fun research recently showing that if you play French music in your restaurant, you will influence people to buy French wines. That, and that sounds really funny, but it actually does work. Like we're such creatures of habit and we're completely susceptible to that type of suggestion. You go into an Italian restaurant and they're playing beautiful Italian music in the background and you're like, oh, you know what? I see the Italian, whatever, I'm not a wine person, Cabernet, I'm gonna buy that. Um, so we'll educate businesses on how to use music in order to maximize the benefits that they can get from it and tell them, look, this, this it's a real thing. You don't want to go to a good life fitness and not have music playing while you're working out. You don't want to go to a hockey game and not hear those iconic organ sounds or the goal songs and stuff like that. So um, one of our key messages is, you know, your music has value. There is value to music and we want to educate businesses on, uh, on, on why, that, uh, why they should be paying for that. Why, uh, of course, they have to. Um, and there is also from our, from our legal team the ability to then, we always want to avoid it, but if businesses do refuse to pay, that we do have the ability to, to litigate and to take them to court and to, to make them pay. Uh, and the damages that can be ensued from refusing to pay copyright royalties can be pretty high. Um, so that covers um, neighboring rights, and that covers what my organization does. And I think what I've been brought here to talk about a little bit is to clear up royalties in general. And so this is where I'm going into territory that I'm familiar with, but again, I don't want to be held to any type of, well, I heard this from this guy named Phil Laffin at Resound, and so you have to do it this way. But in Canada, there are many organizations that handle the collection and distribution of royalties. For Resound, we are the collection branch, but uh, prior to a few years ago, those royalties would be then distributed through performance rights organizations. So that's the MROC, Actor Rax, Artisti, Soproc, Connect people that we were talking about. Um, those, those are performance rights organizations. You would, in order to be eligible to, to collect the neighboring rights royalties, you would have to have been a member of one of those five performance rights organizations. So if you're not a member of Actor Rax, MROC, I'll keep saying their names, Artisti, Soproc, Connect, um, then you're not being paid for neighboring rights royalties, and you should get on that. Um, recently, the Copyright Board, and uh, there's been, you know, not pressure from the industry, it's good pressure, I guess, to say that um, due to the, the administration fees that go along with being a member of one of those performance rights organizations, and ReSound also being responsible for the collection of those tariffs and the, and the lobbying for those tariffs. They wanted artists and performers to be able to sign up directly with ReSound. So now there's also the option of becoming a direct assigner with ReSound. And that means that we will collect your neighboring rights royalties and then we will distribute them directly to you. You don't have to be a member of, of one of those five performance rights organizations anymore in order to, to be able to collect those royalties. You can sign up directly with ReSound to receive your neighboring rights royalties for that. Um, then you have SOCAN, who is responsible for the collection of uh, royalties for songwriters and composers, considered your publishing rights. So when the, the previous panel member said, make sure that you're up to date on all of your SOCAN stuff, I would go one step further and say, make sure that you're up to date on all of your royalty collections. So you want to make sure that if you're a member of one of those five performance rights organizations that I said before, or a direct assigner of ReSound, that your repertoire is up to date with us, that your performer uh, data is up to date with us. So a really kind thing that you can do for your fellow performers on a sound recording is make sure that they're listed on the, uh, on the, on the repertoire data when you submit it. So when you call in to uh, ReSound as a direct assigner or when you call into your performance rights organization, they're gonna ask you for your repertoire um, and ask you who are the performers on that. It, you're not legally obligated by any means to say, you know, uh, hey, Phil played saxophone on this song for me, so make sure that he signed up. But it goes a long way towards helping those other artists make sure that they're collecting their royalties as well. So when you call in, when you're updating your repertoire, give the most accurate snapshot that you possibly can of the saxophone player, 
the the bass player you had a sub come in and play drums for you on this particular recording so make sure that they're there make sure that you know who owns the master recordings of your album of your ep of your single that you're recording that information will all go a long way towards making sure that you're collecting every penny of your royalty dollar um, same thing with socan when you call into the, when you update your publisher or when you go directly with socan you're going to want to make sure that they have all of your the, the accurate composer data um, so they want to know who's the composer of the song songwriters anything like that that's what's pertinent to socan um, on the master rights side of things that's through connect an organization called connect um, again they're just going to want to know the name of the entity who owns the master sound recordings um, that is Connect are, Connect are responsible for the collection of master rights royalties in Canada. So they are a member organization of ReSound. They sit on our board. They're one of those five organizations that lobbied for change to the legislation. And Connect Music Licensing are the sole entity in Canada responsible for the distribution of those master rights royalties. So we've got master rights with Connect Music Licensing. We've got neighboring rights with resound music licensing. We've got publishing rights, composer songwriters with SOCAN. Then there's also kind of like the CMRRA for mechanicals. Um, so I would say that it's, it's absolutely um, paramount if you're, a, if you're in the music industry, if you're a music entrepreneur, to make sure that you're on top of that to make sure that you are high aware of, of all of those organizations that are responsible for collecting those royalties. There are also, and this get complicates things even further, but there are also people that are signed up with Sound Exchange in the United States to collect royalties in Canada. So you don't necessarily need to be a member of Connect to collect your master rights. You can be a member of Sound Exchange. And if you are a member of Sound Exchange, what's happening is, is that we're still administering those rights at ReSound. We're still distributing those rights to Connect, and then they're linking up with Sound Exchange to make sure that you get paid again. Um, it's not clean by any stretch of the imagination when that type of thing starts happening, but due to the nature of, um, of how these organizations are set up, we can only collect for our own territory. So we are responsible for all of the collection of those royalties in Canada. We can't go to the United States to collect, and vice versa, they can't do it. But we have reciprocal agreements in place with the majority of the developed world, um, including Sound Exchange, including um, Scandinavian countries, Irma in Ireland, uh, PRS in the UK, so that they'll collect for Canadian recordings or Canadian performers in the, their own territories, and then distribute those royalties through us in Canada. We do the same for them, so if there's a UK artist that gets royalties for their sound recordings in Canada, we will collect those royalties, send them to PRS so that they can be distributed in their own territory. Um, we're not allowed to cross the streams, for lack of a better word. We're not, we can't go to the UK to collect, we can't go to Brazil to collect, we can't go to the United States to collect. And in fact, in the United States, they don't have neighboring rights for performers yet. They're one of the only countries in the developed world that are not a part of the Rome Convention, which is essentially the recognition of those performer royalties. So in the United States, they don't recognize the contributions of performers on sound recordings. They will collect for composers and songwriters, and they will collect for master rights owners, but they do not collect in the United States for performers on sound recordings. Yes. Um, when you say they do feature artists. Um, so to the best of my knowledge at this point, they're not, uh, that w it would have either been from a, a songwriting standpoint or uh, a master rights ownership that it wouldn't have actually been now again this is what where it, once I step outside the realm of, of resound to a certain extent I, I, I don't know the answer 100% certain but they don't have 
I do know that they don't have uh, performance rights royalties uh, or neighboring rights royalties in the United States. Um, there might be a small consideration for a feature performer on that. Um, or it may be that you're being paid for, for sound exchange from a, uh, a recording that was recorded in Canada. So again, we can collect royalties for Canadian performers. This is, guys, it's a tangly web. If, you're a, if it's a Canadian recording, a Canadian label or a Canadian performer, it has to meet a certain criteria. If that gets paid in the United States, we'll still collect the performance, like we'll still collect the neighboring rights royalties from them. It's just that American artists, US, US performers on sound recordings are not eligible to be compensated. So you as a Canadian, absolutely, if your recording gets played anywhere in the world, we want to be able to collect that neighboring rights royalty. But for, for instance, if you, were an American musician playing on an American recording, you would not be eligible to collect neighboring rights for that recording. And then it gets even more complicated. If you're an American performer, but you play in a Canadian band on a Canadian label on an album that's recorded in Canada, suddenly the world of neighboring rights royalties opens up to you. It's similar to um, the, the, the Maple thing, where there's a three criteria that you have to meet in order to be able to collect for that type of thing. So the sound recording has to be Canadian itself, the label has to be Canadian, or the performer has to be Canadian. The, the musician performer, that kind of supersedes all. If you're, if you're a Canadian performer, um, you, you'll be eligible to collect neighboring rights, unless you go to the United States on a label in an American band. Um, I hope that answers that question. It's very complicated, um, but it's, it, as you start to peel back the layers, you start to understand that essentially that there are these five main components that you've got. You've got your, your master rights, you've got your composer songwriters, you've got your neighboring rights as a, as a musician performer, and then um, you know, you've you got mechanicals. Then there's also syncs, but syncs, ro sync royalties are, are negotiated directly between the publisher and then the music user itself. So that's like an end level agreement where your music publisher will go directly to um, Sony ATV Canada and, and they'll say, you want to use our song in this television show, it's going to cost this much. And that's a direct agreement between those two entities and usually performance rights organizations won't get involved there. Um, in Canada, uh, another thing that we're working towards but we haven't gotten yet is that um, performers, musicians aren't eligible to collect for music that is synced to video. So when that publisher goes and negotiates that sync agreement, Unfortunately, for if it's film or TV, ReSound is not eligible to collect a royalty on behalf of the the performers on that sound recording. SoCan will still obviously get their the the royalties for the composer and the songwriter, but due to and, and the answer from the copyright board on this was literally due to the language of the Copyright Act as it exists, we are not eligible to collect on sound recordings synced to video. That is a difficult hill to climb to change, but we are working towards it constantly. Uh, we, our hope is that eventually we will be able to collect for music that is synced to video. It, it's, it's a completely arbitrary thing to say you, you're not eligible. They recognize that um, it is a, you know, it's a musical contribution to this and that that performance um, is inherently uh, you know, a copyright they, that, that exists, but just due to the existing language in the Copyright Act, they are not allowing us to collect royalties when uh, any, so, so YouTube, television, film, any type of music that is synced to video, ReSound is not eligible to collect a royalty on that. Uh, it's just public performance of sound recordings at this point for us. ODM does YouTube royalties uh, connect also for the master side of things. Um, they're eligible to collect on, on videos. Uh, so can have an agreement for songwriters and composers. Um, I'm not actually as familiar with ODM and what they do, uh, but if, if they are eligible to collect royalties for YouTube for performers, I would say absolutely get signed up with them and sure. Um, the, I guess my key messaging for this whole thing is to ensure that you're aware of the organizations and what they offer. So for instance, if you're a ReSound direct assigner, you'll get your royalties directly from ReSound for performance rights organizations. If you are signed up with MROC, 
they'll they'll distribute the royalties for you. But if you're not a member of MRock, ActorX, or Resound, then your your royalties are just not getting through to you. And and with um, with the amount of people here who aren't aware of Resound, I, I imagine that there's probably royalties sitting in wait for at least somebody here, one person. Um, making sure that you s are signed up with one of those organizations or direct assignership with Resound. Um, and then again, keeping that repertoire up to date. On the other side of that, signing up with SOCAN, uh, making sure that your rep repertoire there is up to date with the publisher as well, um, is, is, a, is my key messaging for this panel, I guess. Um, I don't really have anything else other than to say, you know, I have a whole history of ReSound and what we've done as an organization, but I think that people here are more interested in, or I, I'm assuming that the interest is more in um, kind of unraveling royalties. So does anybody have any questions uh, specific or unspecific to ReSound or royalties in general at this point? Yeah. Oh God, yes. No, it's not irrelevant. Please make sure that you get ISRC codes. And here's a fun fact. Don't pay CD Baby, oh, sorry. If you want to pay CD Baby, that's fine. You can pay CD Baby for your ISRC codes. Oh, sorry, ISRC, because the C in ISRC stands for code, so. Um, get your ISRCs directly. You can get them directly from, from Connect Music Licensing. You can call into Connect, and they will just assign you uh, an ISRC. And what that ISRC is, is essentially just your, uh, it's a country code, and then it's a label code, and then it's a track code. So you'll get like a number that's assigned to you for Canada, a number that's assigned to you for your organization as, uh, you know, Phil Laffin Records, and then literally 001 for the first track that you submit. Those ISRCs help us so much because we are dealing with sometimes and we in this this new world of sound recordings now where um, the performers on um, your original track or your remix or an easy example is a band like Pearl Jam who record and release every single one of their live shows so you've got like even flow live in Boston and even flow live from Toronto and even flow live from wherever live from Calgary there might be a different performer on any of those given tracks. And if you don't have the right ISRC locked in, then it's gonna refer back to, we're gonna get an error and we'll have to manually match it to the right song and stuff like that. But it, that becomes time consuming and that, that's where we get bogged down in a lot of things. Um, the ISRC will allow us to refer directly to that specific track. If you release a, a, like a, your single and then a remix and then a, here now I'm releasing this with, with a guest verse from this other person, those three, tra those three versions of that same song will have three distinct ISRCs. That helps us immensely in identifying the proper track to assign the royalties to. Vice versa, sometimes what we get is one track with seven different ISRCs for some reason. Um, right now, sometimes the radio broadcasters are not really great at including that information, but they have to legally, so we've been pushing really hard to get that. But they're, they, they're of the utmost importance in making our work simplified and not allowing those tracks to get bogged down and just kind of sitting in a pool until we can resolve those. So yes, ISRCs are super important. Get them for free from Connect Music Licensing. They'll just assign you a bunch of them and, and it's a wonderful service that they do. Uh, any other questions? Yes. The beauty of licensing in Canada is that you absolutely can. Um, so the way our licensing for businesses works is it's a blanket license. Um, so you can, people often when we call them up, the, especially smaller organizations will say, well, I bought this CD at wherever, so I'm, I should be free to use it. It's like, well, you're buying that for personal use. And what we do is provide you with a license to, to allow that song to be publicly performed. So you work at a venue, if you have a SOCAN license and a ReSound license for that venue, that is a blanket license, that is carte blanche for you to play whatever you want. 
we don't license the individual tracks that you're playing. The way that we pay out, and this is going to get some slack, I'm sure, the way that we pay out is based on radio broadcast logs. So this is the best available proxy that we currently have to be able to pay out royalties. So when we license a business, we don't ask them for the songs that they're playing. We don't license them for specific albums. We say, here's your license. You can play whatever you want. And I know for a fact that it's the exact same thing with SoCan. When SoCan licenses a business for the use of, of recorded music, um, they're licensed to play whatever they want from whatever they, their source they want. You can play a cassette, 8-track, Spotify, iTunes, CDs, whatever you want. You are good to go. You are licensed fully. The, the next question that you're going to get from those artists coming through your venue is, well, how do I know that I'm getting paid for you playing that? And the unfortunate answer right now is, is that we pay out based on the radio broadcast logs. So in Canada, radio broadcasters are obligated by law to send us their logs 365 days a year. Gone are the days of the like one hour long log that the radio station sends in once a month and we use that. They now have to send us the whole year's worth of radio broadcast logs. Everything that they play in a whole year, they have to send that to us. We ingest that in and we use a, our a pretty massive computer function to be able to say, okay, we ingest that, we say this is all of the music that's being played on radio. That includes campus radio, that includes nonprofit, like, you know, uh, local radio, and as well as the big commercial radio. And we pay out royalties based on those logs. So unfortunately, at the moment, we don't pay out based on Spotify logs. We don't pay out based on what a venue is playing. We've had lots of people call, excuse me, we've had lots of businesses when we call them and say, um, well, I play um, you know, these five bands constantly. I want to make sure that they're getting the royalties for this. Unfortunately, in Canada, that's not the way it works right now. Um, they're, we're, part of what we do is to constantly strive for the best available option for, this, for these royalty payouts. So we've explored venues of, we're involved in talks right now about, and this gets my mind running, about um, blockchain and using smart contracts and blockchain to be able to pay out as a one-for-one -one, uh, ratio. So what it would essentially be, and it's, we're, we're a decade or more away from this, but everyone has like the Shazam app that tells you exactly. Essentially what we would love to be able to do is put a Shazam box in every business in Canada and have them just that report every single song that they play and then we pay out based on that. But that's the reality is that just doesn't work right now. We can't pay out based on Spotify because they're not obligated by law to send us their logs. Radio stations are, and so we use that information to pay out royalties. The good news is, is that if you're getting played on campus radio, if you're getting pay, played on indie radio, local stations, you will still get royalties for that. It's just that by and large, what ends up happening is, is that the, the, the big bands that get played prime time, drive at five, or whatever you want to call it, those are the royalties that get paid out in the biggest chunks at the moment. But that being said, I see all the time that um, local artists from Toronto, I go and I do, um, once every three months, I go to uh, Canada's Music inc Incubator and, and give a talk. And, and consistently I see these artists that are smaller local artists and I get them to kind of search for their songs in their database and, uh, and at least one of them will have royalties waiting for them that they don't know about. So, so it's not just kind of like, we don't pay out based on Spotify. If you, if you are getting traction in any type of radio, you will get royalties for it. So, um, so by all means, play all of the bands that you want to play at your business. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Yes. Yeah, so SoCan and ReSound get those logs 365 days a year. And we have, like, uh, ReSound has a staff of about four people that are, that are just responsible for the digestion of that information. So I assume SoCan probably has about double. Um, and ReSound and SoCan work very closely together. Uh, we're, the two organizations are, are on, like, a... I won't say a collision course, but a convergence course, um, because we are the two bodies in Canada responsible for licensing businesses in this way. Um, and so, you know, one of the one of the things that I meet up with most often is when I call a business, they say, "Well, we've already got a SoCan license, so we don't need you." 
I'm like, no, you still need to get a resound license as well. Uh, and so businesses oftentimes are like, well, why do I need a SOCAN license and a resound license? It is because we represent two different groups of rights holders, but more recently, in the last couple of years, Resound and SOCAN have been working together. Um, July 2016, we rolled out a joint portal for businesses in a certain sector. So for one of our tariffs, we said, let's just do this together. We'll one phone call, one license, one invoice, one payment, and we'll split everything up on the back end because we know our own parts of each of those. That was a huge success. So I think we're progressing forward. The hope is, I think, that we'll roll out more and more like that so that businesses won't have this confusion over why am I paying two different types of royalties for music and we'll just be able to go to your bar and say, hey, this is your license for the use of music. This covers your neighboring rights royalties. This covers your composer royalties. You're going to pay this one invoice and, and we're going to we're going to take that and we're going to divvy it up and pay out the performers and the composers based on the existing tariff legislation. So both organizations are still separate, but we're, we're working together on being able to to license businesses in a more simplified way so that they're not getting two different invoices and they have to get calls from two different businesses all the time. Um, so uh, yes, they absolutely are getting the 365 days a year reporting that we get as well. Um, it's based on different factors and so every different use of music will um, will fall under a different tariff category now. So we have tariff one through eight at this point, and then each of those tariffs ha tariff has subcategories. So I'll go, I'll go for a typical bar first. A typical um, Irish pub, we will base their, uh, their royalty rate their, on, on um, their capacity or their average daily attendance. Usually it's based on capacity. We get, we, we get um, liquor licenses from most provinces. So we'll get the, the liquor list and we'll know a venue's capacity before we even call them up to let them know that they're supposed to be paying. Um, so for a business that's just using background music, we'll calculate it based on their capacity. Um, the, the minimum for background music for resound license right now is roughly $30 plus tax a year. Um, so that would cover most businesses with a capacity of under 100. Um, if the business is larger, it would go up incrementally. But then let's just say now it's no longer an Irish pub, now it's a dance club. A dance club's use of music is more valuable to that business than just a, a place where it's playing music in the background. So that license fee goes up. And now it's based on capacity and the days of operation where they have a dance floor. Uh, so if they have dance Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, and their uh, capacity is you know, um, 500, they're paying a, a higher license fee. And, it, and there, again, there's different usages based on the di uh, different tariffs based on the different usages. So recently, the Canadian Copyright Board certified uh, an adult entertainment tariff, um, which is for strip clubs. So as you can imagine, the value of music to a strip club is extremely high compared to the value of music to um, a small restaurant that just plays background music. Um, again, we have a, a tariff for fitness. There's tariff for um, fireworks, ice shows, skating, public skate, um, weddings, receptions, and banquets. Um, and each of those will be based on a certain set of criteria. So again, those criteria are born out of negotiations with industry associations. So for bars, we went to the food and beverage industry associations and said, we want to negotiate this. You guys are going to have to pay it. Better we come to those terms together than to go to the copyright board and, and, and butt heads over this type of thing. So we go to the industry associations, negotiate a fair rate, take that to the copyright board, get them to certify that rate, and then we go to town and we call up all of the other businesses and say, this is the certified rate. This is what the copyright board is deemed as fair. Um, usually for small, medium businesses, it's going to be a, a percentage of the, like the capacity. Um, for businesses like the, um, for, so for sporting events, for the Calgary Flames games or for, um, you know, the Stampeders, it's a percentage of their gross receipts on their ticket sales. Um, for, um, for wedding 
uh, and banquet uh, weddings and banquets. It's a calculation of whether or not there was dancing at the event and then the capacity of the venue itself. Um, there's a plethora of different criteria that can be applied to different uses of music. Um, generally speaking though, when people find out what their resound fee is, they regret getting so upset over it in the first place because when you tell a business that you're, you know, hey, you need to pay for the mu use of music in your business, there's an immediate kind of like, I'm gonna get my back up against the wall here, I bought that CD, or it's my Spotify account, uh, and when you finally get through, it takes about a few minutes and you say, hey look, I can calculate your license fee in a couple of seconds, it's going to be $50 a year for the use of music in your business. That They start to come down a little bit and they say, okay, okay, I can deal with that, all right, fine. And if you think about the amount of revenue that music can generate for that business, so again, you, you can't undersell the value of music to, to a good life fitness or to a sporting franchise or to a dance club or an adult entertainment club. Uh, if you, you know, the business, uh, music drives business in a lot of those cases. And it's a quantifiable thing where you can say, look, Tim Hortons, Walmart, wherever, if you're, you, you guys put enough stock in the music that you use that you're creating your own playlists to, to cater to your business, then you know that there's value there and you know that you need to pay a music license fee for that. Um, so generally, uh, most, most people are receptive to it. Um, just kind of... So live music is not our uh, realm at ReSound uh, because the, the, that's exactly, that's so can. So um, the nature of the royalty that we collect on, the copyright that we represent, is intrinsic in the sound recording itself. The, the, perf the, the reason that we can collect a royalty on a sound recording is because of that drummer's performance on that sound recording or that singer's performance on that sound recording. As soon as it's someone else playing it at a venue live, it's no longer that same performance on the sound recording, so ReSound doesn't collect a royalty on that. The, the fee for live music at venues, I don't know what the calculation is itself, but it, um, SOCAN is responsible for it, and what happens with them is, is that those bands that are playing at those venues have reporting forms. I know because I'm also a musician and I've been in bands for years. So when you play at a live venue and you start to get big enough, you know that, well, I have to charge at least $6 because if I don't charge $6, then I'm not eligible for my SOCAN royalties for the live performance. That's a little thing that if, if you guys don't know that, you, you, should, you really should. If you're charging $5 or less at the door, you're not eligible to collect those SOCAN royalties. I think, I don't know if that's changed since I was performing. It's still true. So you gotta charge six bucks at the door at least and then you can submit, you gotta get the manager's signature. They absolutely do have, this, have a SOCAN license. But, and here's the beauty of that. If they don't, and the musician reports their SOCAN report, and they're like, yeah, well, we played it live at that venue, and SOCAN gets the report, but the business doesn't have a license for it, then SOCAN knows who they've got to call next. And they say, well, yeah, here's the proof that you guys, are using, that you guys have live performances and are using music at the venue. So definitely be on top of like, filling out those forms and uh, getting the sound engineer's signature so that you can report that in, because even if they don't have a SOCAN license there, SOCAN will call them up and make sure that they get one. Uh, there's not, and I think the reason why not is because you're being compensated for that particular performance through the door charge that you're charging, right? So the reason that, so people will say, well, why do we have to pay the performers? They get paid when they're in the studio. They're getting paid in the studio for their services in recording that song. When you publicly perform that elsewhere, that's what we call, we refer to it as a public performance, even though it's a sound recording being played. It's a public performance of that sound recording. So that's above and beyond what was the initial intention of that payment. So now you're playing my, uh, a really easy example to, to, to grasp on is like the saxophone performances on, uh, on Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, right? Those are iconic saxophone lines. And, and, and he put a great deal of effort into composing that. That's not the band that composed it. He doesn't get a composer credit, but so when that, saxophone performance gets played on a sound recording outside of 
you know, the the venue when they when they play that at uh, the prog rock bar that you go to to listen to Pink Floyd, then that performer on that sound recording, his copywritten work is being reproduced again, and that is what that is the that's the denoter, that's the marker that says, okay, we need to pay another royalty for that now because it's a public performance of that sound recording. If you play it, when you're playing live, you're being compensated, you're being paid as a live music performer and you're getting your compensation as, as you, either your cut of the door or your cut of the bar sales or whatever. So that, I think, is why that royalty doesn't exist live. Sorry, I think I saw another question, maybe. Does anybody, yeah, sure, go ahead, please. Sorry, uh, could you repeat the question you, you, you are... Okay. So there's, no, no, well, uh, uh, the quick answer to that is no, they wouldn't be submitting to ReSound because again, excuse me, those merchandise sales are not triggering that royalty that, that we collect on for the public performance of the sound recording. If they take the CD out and they pop it in the player and they start playing it, then yes. But what I would imagine would be ideal for that type of app would be for them to report to the CMRRA. Uh, they're responsible for mechanicals. So CD sales absolutely sh are tracked. And those royalties are paid out by CMRRA. Um, I used to work there back in 2008, and uh, I worked in the, the major label side. And, and what they do is they, they absolutely do track CD sales, and every time a CD gets sold, um, a portion of that, usually between eight and 10 cents, gets given directly to the publisher, which is again, composer, songwriter rights. Um, whether or not, they do track that, I don't know, but recently Sound Exchange bought the CMRRA. Uh, so Sound Exchange in the United States bought CMRRA. I don't know if you guys know that, but that's pretty big news. Um, so I would imagine being that Sound Exchange are super tech savvy organization and really well set up, that they're, that they're monitoring that. Um, SoCan as well has just recently bought IP to be able to track um, online performances as well. So like um, SoCan now has uh, they own intellectual property that's set up to be able to track s exactly like the Spotify, how, how much uh, certain tracks are getting played on certain platforms and such. Um, whether or not that particular app is actually reporting to SoundExchange or to the CMRRA, I do not know, but uh, I'm sure that that information would be valuable to them. Sometimes there's also um, information overload in those situations as well. Uh, I don't know what the bandwidth of the CMRA is to be able to handle tracking it through this app and that app and another app and also we're getting information from the labels. But I can't imagine that SoundExchange don't have the capacity to be able to track that type of information. So I imagine that they're on top of it, if not through that app, through another means, 